Hello and welcome to the GTN show. And Mark is joining us from Slovakia, hot off the Collins Cup racing this weekend. We have all that action, plus some tech news and a racing roundup of everything else that happened this weekend. What a weekend of racing we had. Obviously the Collins Cup stole the show. The first time we've seen an event like this in this format and supporting the pros in a whole new category of professional racing. We'll have all that action coming up soon, plus all the other action that happened over the course of the weekend. But first, Mark was out there at the Collins Cup and he caught up with a good friend of mine, Scott DeFilippis, to tell us all about the Collins Cup, plus the Collins Cup's future and the future of triathlon in general. Okay, so I want to start today's show by talking to you guys with Scott DeFilippis, who is the PTO treasurer. Obviously, we're here straight after the Collins Cup. Now, Scott, you've got years of racing professionally. You've now retired. You've stepped over to help with the PTO with, I guess, a, a vision you've had for many years as well. Now, talk me through kind of your involvement with the PTO and how you're helping them then. Yeah, I was in the meeting, the initial meeting in, in 2014 um, in Bahrain. And uh, the organizers there got everyone together and said, you guys need to get your act together, otherwise you're gonna continue to be the custodians of the sport. And that's when the PTU began. And uh, we struggled at first, but then as, as everyone knows, Charles came into the picture with this vision of the Collins Cup and the four majors. And um, he got the old board together and asked who wanted to help. And I raised my hand and said, absolutely. You know, I think we need to do this. Uh, Previous generations um, tried but failed in, in, in forming a, a body of, I mean, not a union, we've, but an organization, right? So um, I think what was missing was that 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 uh, strong person to head it up, and, and that was obviously uh, Charles and now Sam, the CEO, are like uh, one plus one equals three, I think. Brilliant, yeah. So obviously this weekend we've had the inaugural Collins Cup, which in my opinion, and I'm sure many people agree, has been a huge, huge success. Um, and I really want to talk to you today about the future of triathlon and where you see it going, where you hope it will go, and that vision. So you've, you've brought a lot of new things into the sport, I'd say. I mean, one thing I noticed straight off this weekend was the drug testing um, with the pro athletes. Um, so yeah, I don't know if you're happy to give us a bit of insight on some of those things going on. Yeah, well, the, the drug testing um, part of it is, is the athletes wanting a bit more transparency. Uh, now that we're actually uh, an organization and, and a unit and, and functioning uh, together uh, as one, um, we felt like uh, we needed to go one step above the water code. And so we've, we've taken on board the task of the, the mighty task of, uh, of uh, starting our own anti-doping program. And so, yeah, we did, a, uh, we performed our second uh, dry blood spot uh, testing protocol here. The first one was in Daytona and that was a tremendous success. And um, the PTO has hired a, a woman by the name of Michelle Verukin, who is, uh, her, her company is called Sports Integrity. Wonderful lady. Um, and she's been on the forefront of, of dry blood spot testing for the last few years and has been pushing us to kind of pursue this. So um, it's really, really exciting. It's very slow as, as everyone on the committee is, is learning. The anti-doping world, the water world is super slow. Nothing happens overnight, but we have a long vision uh, two, three years down the, down the road where it'll be less invasive, more efficient, and uh, a lot more, uh, less costly. Brilliant, okay, and going back to the events itself, so Collins Cup this weekend, what's the plan in the future for the PTO events and any events for that matter? Yeah, I think the Collins Cup was was a long time coming. It was it, I, almost flawless. The weather caused a few crashes and that was unfortunate, but what can you do about that? I think, um, yeah, obviously we're, we're looking for four majors and uh, I know that there are some cities involved that are interested, certainly a few were here, and, and that was exciting to get to talk to some of them and 
Last night at the pub, they were, there were a few who were chomping at the bit. We want an event, so uh, I think uh, we're just gonna have to wait and see. We'll let Sam work out the details there, but obviously the Collins Cup is meant to be an annual thing, so uh, COVID perhaps was a blessing in disguise because it gave the organization a little bit more time to plan, and, um, and I think it was an absolute uh, home run. Awesome. Um, and I do feel like, just in the last couple of years, there's been so many additions and changes to the sport. We've got things like Super League, um, World WTCS events, which show eliminator formats, PTO, Collins Cup. Do you see this as a, a great thing for triathlon, a lot of change? And I mean, how do you see it all? Yeah, well, development is a big, big passion of mine and looking out for the, the lower ranked athletes because they're the future, right? If you don't water the roots, then the tree's not gonna grow. So I think what Super League is doing is really fantastic. Uh, the next generation, these these athletes are gonna be absolute monsters. I mean, you're seeing it with, with um, what uh, Taylor Nib did on the weekend, absolutely incredible. So, um, uh, and, and Gustav and the Norwegians, it's gonna be really, really cool to see what they do, the world champs and you know, 70.3. Um, so, yeah, I think all of these new things coming into the sport are great, but at the same time, we don't want to lose uh, some of the pillars, right? Roth, for sure. Obviously, Kona is a, is a massive part of the sport, and that all needs to be included. So if we can all come together and, and uh, work together, everyone's going to benefit, right? Yeah. The sport's just going to get bigger and bigger. And with television now in play, I've always felt that TV was a possibility, and uh, it wasn't really until Charles and Sam came along that said, absolutely, we can do this. It's made for television. And so uh, the PTO, I think, is proving that. Well, congratulations on a superb event this weekend. I know it wasn't an easy task, um, but you guys pulled it off superbly, so thank you very much. No, thank you. On with your try news, and starting with this news, not such good news out of World Triathlon, 34-year-old Alexander Brukhankov has tested positive. This comes from a test taken at the European Sprint and Relay Championships in Kutzbühel, Austria in June, and he has tested positive for EPO. The 34-year-old has been around triathlon for many, many years. Uh, he had a breakthrough year in 2009 where he came third in the European Champs and third at the WTS Hamburg. And it comes just a few days after news that his fellow countryman Igor Polyansky had returned an adverse analytical finding also for EPO. Not such good news there. On with some more bad news, and many of you will have seen by now the news that Nathan Ford, a top British amateur triathlete, had a serious accident at the British Middle Distance Champs in Aberfeldy, Scotland last Sunday. He suffered spinal and brain injuries and he currently cannot breathe or move independently. Our hearts go out to him and his family, of course. Uh, his wife has set up a GoFundMe page to support Nathan, but also to support the family who are currently having to travel up to Scotland to be with him and pay for their accommodation because he cannot yet be trans transported. If you would like to support that, the GoFundMe link is down below, so please do support his, him and his family in this hard time. On to a whole lot of running news, starting with this. Alexander Surikin of Lithuania has broken the world record for the longest 24-hour run. He did it in Pabianice, Poland, and the Lithuania ultra runner covered a distance of 309.4 kilometers in 24 hours. That's an average of four minutes and 39 per kilometer for 24 hours. He broke the legendary Yanis Kouras' record mark, which was said to be unbeatable by a solid six kilometers. Uh, what's more, the runner-up on Sunday, Andres Chakuk of Ukraine, also appears to have broken Kouras' record. So some fast running there for 24 hours. In April this year, Surikin actually set the world record for 100 miles of 11 hours, 14 minutes and 56 seconds and carried on that run for another 45 minutes to get the world record for the 12 hour run of 170.3 kilometers. So he's on some fine long distance running form. Uh, 
some more long distance running and this is the Alta Trail Mont Blanc which happened this past weekend. Of course the famous biggest trail marathon in the world covering 171 kilometers with 10,000 meters of elevation gain and over 2,300 runners taking part. This year saw France's Francois de Haine and American Courtney de Volta taking the victories, their fourth and second wins respectively and an impressive time of 20 hours and 45 minutes. For once, they had really good conditions there at that race. The winner, Francois there, was spotted wearing these fancy Salomon prototype shoes that got a few heads turning. Uh, speaking of fast shoes, there's a new half marathon world record on the women's side, again. That's right, Yelimzerf Yehuelor has taken 19 seconds off the women's half marathon world record. She did this in Lawn in Northern Ireland, running the Atrium Coast Half Marathon. She's only 22 years old. She has already shown great form in the half distance, getting a bronze last year in Poland in the world champs for the half marathon. But she missed out on the Ethiopian 10,000 meter team to go to Tokyo because she only came fourth in the 10,000 meter trials. On to our tech news, or as Mark's now christened it, what the tech. Well, this was spotted out in Colin, at the Collins Cup this weekend. For the first time out in the wild, Daniela Reef and Braden Curry were on a new felt. We can't show too many images or, or speak too much about it because they haven't actually released it yet. But we did reach out to felt to ask them, what's up with this? What the tech? And they said, with its DNA in racing, felt is always working with our athletes and we use their input and expertise at all stages of development to refine our bicycles before they're publicly available. This all new triathlon platform set to launch in early 2022 is currently being tested and raced by some of the best athletes in the world, including Daniela Reef and Braden Curry. Riders looking for more information should be sure to follow Felt Bicycles on social media for the latest updates and launch dates and availability. So no real answer about when that bike will actually be available or even any information about the bike itself. Uh, but Mark did have a good look at it, so maybe he'll have some answers when he gets back from Samarin. And some more tech news, if you've ever had trouble keeping track of your swim workouts, well, Form has a solution for you with their new workouts feature. That's right, Form, who brought you those augmented reality swimming goggles where you could see your metrics live in front of you while you're swimming inside your goggles on a little display, now adds a workouts, fe workouts feature where they'll have your whole workout on the display in front of you. You can access this feature with a monthly membership for $19.99 or an annual membership for $179.99 and they'll give you live workouts in every every day for endurance, power, sprint, recovery or technique and you can just follow them live on your on your display in your eye and it'll keep track of what you've done and how much more you have left and tell you exactly what to do in each rep and each interval. On with the race news and starting with of course the Collins Cup. The Collins Cup happening for the first time this last weekend in Samarin, Slovakia. A whole new triathlon format, a whole new setup with 12 individual match races happening and what a lot of drama there was. If you missed all of that action, you can get a catch up where Mark has made. Uh, you can look at that video down below, click the link uh, and he'll give you a full roundup of everything that happened. But there was a lot of drama. In the end, Team Europe did take the win as predicted. No one was particularly surprised by that, but they certainly didn't have the walkover that everyone had thought it was going to be. A few of those race matches throwing up some surprises. There was all kinds of drama, a few bike crashes, and some people just didn't perform where we thought they would. At the end of the day, it was quite the spectacle for triathlon and definitely worth watching. And I think it has an interesting future ahead of it, this race format. We certainly enjoyed watching it, uh, but we're also looking forward to seeing all these athletes go head to head rather than a team competition in their next events. The following day, also in Samarin, Slovakia at the X Bionic Sphere, Challenge held its flagship event, the Championship. And there were a few athletes there who were looking to prove that they should have been called up for the Collins Cup. Uh, amongst those, Florin Angert took the win with Magnus Detlev from Denmark in second and Frederick Funk in third on the men's side. On the women's side, Similarly, a few athletes looking to prove that they should have been selected for the Collins Cup. Lucy Hall eventually took the win there with Sarah Sala in second and Hayley Chura in third. Unfortunately, 
Some of the big names were taken out of the race by taking a wrong turn on the bike. Uh, the likes of Fenella Langridge, India Lee and Lisa Norden took a wrong turn, went 5Ks the wrong way before being directed back to the course. Uh, but 10 extra Ks on the bike meant they were not in contention for the win at all. Unfortunately, these things do happen. Uh, it's frustrating to see, but congratulations, of course, to the winner, Lucy Hall. Also happening this past weekend, you probably watched it on TV. If you didn't, you missed out. Uh, but Heather was over at the Paralympics in Tokyo, and she has a roundup of all the news and racing action that happened there. What an emotional couple of days. I've been so honored to get to commentate on the paratriathlon here in Tokyo at the Paralympic Games. And now I've got the biggest challenge to try to get across those eight races to you guys in a couple of minutes. So it was a sprint distance triathlon for all of the events, non-wetsuit swim as per the Olympics. And it started off on Saturday morning with the men's PTS4. And that was just dominated by the Frenchman, Alexi Henkenquant, who ended up winning by almost four minutes, led from the start, just a class, class act. Great day for Japan. They won their first ever para triathlon medal. That was Uda Hideki, who took the silver. The bronze went to Alejandro Sanchez Palomero, Yes, I do need to check some of these names. I would recommend you check out the story behind Eric McIlvenny. He finished sixth for the USA. You might recognize his name because we actually covered and got to do a feature with him over in Oceanside back in 2019. So go and check that out on GTN if you've not yet seen it. The women's race was the PTS2, so a more severely impaired classification. And that was a clean sweep for the USA back in 2016. And it looked like Great Britain's Fran Brown was going to mix things up here, but she has recently had part of her stomach removed. Yeah, this is how hardcore these athletes are. She led for the majority of the bike, but it was Haley, Haley Dance, sorry, who took the lead at the end of the bike onto the run, led until the last kilometre. And then it was her teammate, Alicia Seeley, who came through to defend her Paralympic title. So won a second gold medal. Haley Dance, her teammate, the silver for the USA. And then a really incredible performance by the young Italian, Veronica Pabani, to win the bronze. This is her third different sport at the third different Paralympic games just amazing there we also had the ptvi the visually impaired class for the men and the women now the women's event was just a pure masterclass by Susana Rodriguez, a Spanish athlete. You might recognize that name or that face because she's recently been on the front cover of the Time magazine. She came fifth in Rio, decided she wanted to come here and win a title. Well, she did that just, yeah, absolute class act. But she's also been working as a doctor, helping out on the COVID ward. So an incredible person, an incredible athlete. The silver in that event went to Anna Barbaro of Italy and the bronze to Annick Cursele of France and that was an emotional finish. It ended up being a last minute surge from the Great Britain. Alison Peasgood supported by the guide Nikki Bartlett and they came forth by just one second. The yeah, sport is seriously cruel. Talking of cruel, the men's race had probably the favourite Dave Ellis from Great Britain. He's three-time world champion had a mechanical the last world championships to miss out on the title at that time but yeah was the one to be all eyes were on him and him and his guy Luke Pollard were moving up through the field on the bike and then the chain snapped on their tandem absolutely gutting for those guys and yeah Paralympic dreams absolutely shattered there and then however it was a great day for Brad Snyder from the USA who won the gold in style silver medal went to Spain's Hector Catala Lapara and Japan won another medal your Neko Satoru took the bronze. So yeah, incredible day of racing on Saturday. I'm gonna have to change sides because my arm's starting to ache, holding the GoPro. All right, Sunday, today, my time. Wow, I can just about remember what happened the early hours of this morning. And we started things off with the wheelchair category, both the men's and the women's race. And Jetsa Platt, you might recognize his name. We've covered him at Super League an absolute machine and yeah the rest of the field didn't stand a chance he defended his Paralympic title he's also going on to try and win the title in the road race and the time trial in just two days time so keep an eye out for that man from the Netherlands yeah double Paralympic champion in the para try well the athletes were left in his wake but it was well it's Florian Brungeber who came second and then Giovanni Chenza hung on for the bronze 50 year old well that was an emotional finish as well the women's event and, well, we had a photo finish. Can you believe it? Yeah, let's bring this as triathlon. It was Lauren Parker, who again, a name you might recognize. She's part of the pro triathlon team, Bahrain Endurance. She led for the whole race until the final second. 
and it was Kendall Gretsch of the USA who had been closing and closing and we ended up with a sprint finish on the blue carpet at the end, photo finish and the American took the title. Yeah, I've got goosebumps talking about that race again and a silver for Lauren Parker, an incredible story. If you don't know that one, do check it out. And then the bronze medal in that race went to Eva Marie, Eva Maria Morel Pedro from Spain. Yeah. Incredible stories all round. We finished the day off with the PTS5 men's and women's race. And George Peasgood from Great Britain set off just on fire, but he didn't manage to hold that lead any further than the first K on the run. And then Martin Schultz, a defending champion from Germany, just a class act. Watching him run was a pleasure. He went to take the title, but George Peasgood, at his debut performance at the Paralympic Games, hung on for the silver. Incredible performance there. The bronze went to Stefan Daniel. He won the silver in Rio, this time the bronze medal. Another women's race. Well, it was kind of looking like it was going to be a competition between the defending Paralympic champion, the reigning world champion, and the reigning European champion. So that is um, Grace Norman, Lauren Stedman, and Claire Cashmore. And it was a close race between Grace Norman and Lauren Stedman, uh, Lauren Stedman at the front, and it ended up being Lauren Stedman who just paced it to perfection and got the victory. She moved up from silver that she won in Rio to take the Paralympic title. Grace Norman delighted with the silver with the really strong team of the USA and Claire Cashmore taking the bronze in her fifth Paralympic Games, but her debut in paratriathlon. And you can probably tell, yeah, I am just on a high from watching all of that. It's just been incredible. And we'll quickly round up the rest of the racing news that happened this weekend. There were a lot of races. Challenge Davos, unfortunately the weather played a big part there uh, with seven degrees Celsius at the start and uh, light snow at the top of the pass. That became a duathlon uh, and a challenging duathlon at that. Spaniard Roberto Sanchez took the win. His compatriot Alberto Moreno Mullins was second and Samuel Bottinger from Germany was third on the men's side. On the women's side, Olympic champion from 2012, Nicholas Spirig led from start to finish uh, to beat previous winner in 2017 and 2018, Lena Berlinger of Germany, with third place going to Georgia Priaroni from Italy. Uh, the weather obviously in the mountains, always a factor and they've definitely had problems there. But with Davos at 1500 meters high and at 2300 meters at the top of Fluella Pass, the weather is always going to be a factor in those mountains. Also in the mountains this weekend, 70.3 Zell MC happened in Austria. Laura Philip of Germany taking the win on the women's side with Anne Reichmann in second and Kaida Kiv Kivioja in third. On the men's side, Jan Stratman of Germany took the win ahead of two Austrians, Lukas Holos and George Ezenberger on their home races. And then 70.3 Maine. Uh, a men's only race there. Bradley Weiss from South Africa took the win ahead of Mark Dubrick of the US and third place Andre Lopez of Brazil. In Hamburg, the final qualification race for the Ironman World Champs for the women. American Lauren Brandon led out the water with a massive eight minute lead and she would still be leading coming off the back still with a four minute lead. But Lauren Zimmerman would run her down to take the win in that first Kona slot and Renee Kali also running up to second place to take the second Kona spot with Lauren Brandon rounding out the podium in third. Of course that Kona spot is for the February Kona race and coming up this weekend we start a whole new qualification block for the following. Uh, that is Ironman Switzerland in Thun with a men and pro race. Also this weekend coming up, Challenge Roth finally happening. Instead of July, it's been moved to the 5th of September date and we're looking forward to that one. We've also heard some rumors that some athletes who will no longer be racing Kona because it's been moved to February uh, might have thrown their hat in the ring at the last minute for that. We don't have an updated start list yet. It should be coming out tomorrow so look for that and maybe some big names jumping in at the last minute at Challenge Roth. Also coming up this weekend 70.3 South Africa and I'm at 70.3 Warsaw and of course short distance racing resumes with the Super League in London the first of those races with the team format uh, and they'll have a Super League every weekend in September. Well, hello, it's me again. I'm jumping back in to take a look through some of your photos that you sent in to us. We've got three great ones this week. Firstly, from Yannick from Sable de Lons in France, which is a lovely place. Actually did one of my first elite races there in a very, very choppy sea. Uh, he's on a Scott Plasma 5, uh, which is a lovely looking bike with DT Swiss wheel on the front and a nice disc wheel on the rear. 
He says he's on a recovery ride after an Ironman 70.3 earlier this year. Um, very good. Next one um, sent in from Jeremy, finishing the Rev3 New England event with his daughter crossing the line with him. Although clearly didn't get the memo of crossing the line with her dad because she looks like she's trying to out-sprint him. Um, looks brilliant though. Uh, and then finally from Ivan, uh, sent in a photo of his lovely looking Argon 18. Um, this is from Texas, he says, speeding through my neighborhood and school zones. Yeah, very good going. Please do keep your photos coming in using the photo uploader link that you can see on screen right now, or you can find it in the description just down below. Finally, we've got the caption competition, your chance to get hold of a GTN swim cap with the best caption. So, last week we had a photo from Ironman Copenhagen with Lionel Sanders and Cam Worth having a chat post-race. Uh, so, great captions coming in. First one from Fergal Akala is saying, now both Jan and I can live rent-free in your heads. Um, yeah, suggesting some mind games from Cam and Jan. Uh, next one from John Pedersen uh, with Cam saying, your bike splits suck. And Lionel saying, you're my coach. Bit of banter lately with Cam being Lionel's coach, etc. But anyway, uh, and then another one on a similar vein. And the winner for this week's caption comp came from uh, Gerald Kesling. I said, Coach, there was some guy in front of me. I needed your tips today. Where have you been? Um, so, yeah, you are the winner. Please uh, get in touch and we will send a cap out to you ASAP. But this week, we have this photo from the Collins Cup. Do your best, leave your captions in the comments section down below. But that is it for the show this week. I do actually want to rewind a little bit to last week's show though, because a few people got involved and left some comments that I thought I'd get stuck into. So one person said, Jonas Ler, no beer mile on Hawaii for Mark this year, sad face. I know it really is a sad face, although I will do my best to recreate the beer mile um, if we don't make it out to Kona. Um, Diego Imner said, there are rumors Kona was postponed so Christian Blumenfeld wouldn't be able to win everything in a single year. I think you've got a good point. He's on an absolute blinder this year. Uh, and then finally, Mika Fellow says, Honduras isn't an island, just so you know. There are a few people that left similar comments. So um, yeah, apologies there. I think we're maybe referring to, or thinking of the Ruatan Island, which I think both of us have been to. Um, so yeah, sorry we didn't uh, pick up on that at the time. Uh, but as I said, that's, the, that's it for the show this week. Uh, we've got loads coming up on the channel, some very exciting videos, in fact. We're gonna be deep diving and taking a look into Lionel Sanders' data with him himself, using his Whoop device, that is a, Really interesting one, looking back at Ironman Copenhagen, leading into the Collins Cup and beyond. Uh, also, James and myself did a budget triathlon. It really was pretty cool as well, so do stay tuned for that. As always, make sure you check out the GTN shop to get a hold of some of our merch, our jumpers, t-shirts, towels, and so on. If you haven't done so already, make sure you're subscribed to our channel and make sure you give this video a big fat like. Also, if you haven't done so already, make sure you go over and check out our How Much Does Jan Frodeno's Bike Cost? I think it was actually a dream come true being able to chat through his lovely Canyon Speedmax. It's a brilliant video. Um, and then also, if you haven't done so already, also check out our Collins Cut behind the scenes reaction. You can see all the action unfold and all the decisions that were made.